it's a great pleasure and no doubt an honour to have a chance to talk to Michael O'Sullivan, who I've known for some years, and I always ask by ask at the beginning, um, when and where were you born? I was born in Birmingham in December 1958. And I also then ask about ancestors, and you don't need to go back to the Tang dynasty or even to the uh, English Civil War. It's really people who might have influenced you, your grandparents, generation or above, mm -hmm. who knowing something about them would help the viewer to get some idea of your ancestry. Where would you like to start? Um, with I know a bit more about the Irish side than the English side. Um, I'll go back briefly mm. to how my father came to be born in the part of Ireland where, where he was born. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. So, um, I'm Irish on my father's side and English on my mother's side, but having been born in Birmingham and grown up there, I've always felt mainly British. Um, my father was born on a farm in County Galway, Ireland, and more recently some of my family did some ancestor research and uh, discovered that the O'Sullivans of that part of Ireland were the remnants of the scattered defeated army um, defeated by the English at the Battle of Kinsale. Uh, because the O'Sullivans originally come from the southwest of Ireland. Is the Battle of Kinsale the, the Civil War? Is it Cromwell? Or? Uh, yes, it was when the it was the last big military defeat mm. um, for the Irish, mm. which effectively led to the to, to the English ascendancy mm. Mm. in Ireland, and many O'Sullivans and others were displaced, mm. um, and I believe three ancestors then moved to what's now County Galway, married locally. Uh, therefore acquired land and um, many generations of O'Sullivans have farmed the same corner of northern county Galway where my, my father and his brothers were raised. During the war, the Second World War, um, the economy was rather depressed and my father took up the opportunity of war work in England where young men arriving from Ireland were assigned work but guaranteed a job um, and he was assigned to Birmingham to work at the Lucas factory producing I think munitions and also keeping fire watch on the roof so although a neutral as an Irish citizen he found himself um, with, a, with, a, with a bucket of sand on the roof of the Lucas factory in Birmingham he always regarded Ireland as home mm. uh, never acquired formal British citizenship and always referred to Ireland as home um, but he married my mother, an English Catholic, whom he met at a parish dance and therefore never returned because they, they settled down and had children in Birmingham. He was a Catholic, I'm saying. He, he was a Catholic mm. and, and a practicing Catholic all, mm. all his life, uh, as was my mother. Uh, my mother was the daughter of, a, of a, a woman who was an English Catholic. I don't know much about the ancestry on my mother's side. They, they were Herberts, so... I would guess that somewhere is a Norman lineage, but mm. they came from the Birmingham working class. So all my known relatives in Birmingham uh, were, were what was then called uh, Birmingham working class. And mm. they were all, as far as I could tell, 100% English. Whereas all my other relatives, uh, close ones, were in Ireland on my father's side. Mm. Although I gather branches of the O'Sullivans went, went to, to America. Mm. And, uh, and to Australia. So I was born in Birmingham, second of four children, um, in a semi-detached house in the, in the North Birmingham suburb of Erdington. Um, in those days, um, children were mostly born at home, unlike now. I think the policy was that the first child um, was born in hospital and if all went well and all seemed regular with the pregnancy, subsequent children were delivered at home by a visiting midwife, who I recall lived around the corner. Uh, of course, I don't recall that from my <laughs> own birth, but from the subsequent birth of my siblings who mm. were delivered in the same mm. front room by the same, uh, the same midwife. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how I came into being. 
tell me something about, uh, did your mother have a job or work at any time? Or She did. My, my mother was a, uh, a very clever person. Um, she was one of a large family. Her mother um, died early mm. in rather sad circumstances. So, her, and her father uh, had a low-income job, I suppose. Uh, so she had to give up education he quite early. He was in early. the factory or...? He was doing, I believe, factory work, mm. yes. Um, but m- money was certainly um, in short supply. And she had to give up her education at around the age of 17 in order to be a, a surrogate mother to her younger siblings. Mm. Uh, she was the oldest daughter in the family. Um, I discovered my mother's educational excellence um, actually as a teenager rooting through a cupboard at home and I found a book prize that she'd won mm. her coming top of her class, I, I suppose, at the age of 16 or so, shortly mm. before she had to give up uh, her education. But she's the sort of person who would certainly nowadays go to university and, and do well mm. at university. But of course in those days... Uh, that was much less uh, common. Um, so she um, she left education, um, learnt typing at commercial college and shorthand. And even when I was small and had uh, one older sister and, and a younger sister and brother, she still used to take in typing work mm. from a local law firm and uh, copy type. I remember her tapping away on one of those old manual typewriters, mm. uh, copying documents with rather impressive red wax seals mm. on them, um, and occasionally going with her to pick up or return work from the, the law firm about, about a mile away mm. where we lived. My father always worked, um, but um, my mother worked um, at, at, at home, I suppose, on a piecework basis. What did your father do? My father um, completely changed his work. So he started as a, a farmer mm-hmm. um, or farm boy, um, but they did own land in Ireland. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, then his war work was uh, industrial. Mm-hmm. But after the war, he joined a financial company. So he was involved in loans and higher purchase and um, rose to become the manager of a branch. Um, <laughs> I think it was an extremely small branch. I think it was my father and one or two <laughs> other people. But uh, I, I do remember that when we travelled back to Ireland, as we did most years, it, it was made to sound very good. <laughs> uh, I think it's usually the case with the diaspora that mm. when, when they go home, they make it sound a bit bigger than it really is. Mm. Well, did the firm have, I mean, the, the firm in general have a name or...? Yes, yeah, so when he joined it, uh, when I was small, I recall it was called Practical Credit Services mm. and was later, I think, bought by something larger. And then mm. it, when he, by the time he retired, I think at the age of 65, it had become Provident mm. Financial Services. Mm. Um, I think he was quite good at it in that my father um, had the, um, the famous Irish charm. He could talk mm. to anybody mm. of any background. Um, he, was, he was a very honest person um, and, and a rather kind person, but I think it stood him in good stead, um, persuading hard-up people that they oughtn't to get into arrears. I think it was all done with a good deal of charm and sympathy. And after he retired, he, he actually worked a lot for um, victim support, mm. um, the uh, charity that looks after the, the victims of crimes, helps elderly people improve the security in their homes or file insurance claims and so on. Um, He used to claim when he was about 70 that his victim support work had put him in such good standing with the local police um, that he was in no danger of ever receiving a parking ticket or (laughs) being apprehended for any other misdemeanor. (laughs) Tell me how about their characters and how that might have influenced you. I mean, you're, you mentioned your mother, very clever. Was Did she encourage you with books and reading and university and so on? Or? Um, yes and no. Um, my, my mother certainly encouraged me in my early education. I, I remember well, she used to talk to me a lot, read to me a lot when I was small, which must have been quite difficult considering the load of housework and, um, 
and typing at home. Um, and later, when we were when when we children were a little, a little older, she took part time work as a school school lunch supervisor at a nearby school. She was always working and went back to work quite late in life as a full time typist at the um, at the at the county courts in Birmingham, which is where she eventually retired from. So she must have made quite an effort, as I was one of four, and she had a lot else on. Um, but I do recall her reading to me a lot and encouraging me to use the local library. I, I don't think I needed much encouragement, but I'm sure I, I, I recall mm. getting some um, from my mother. Um, on the other hand, both my mother and my father were not um, directive in regard to my education. So I don't recall them ever um, expressing an opinion, um, never mind an instruction Mm. as to what I should study at school or um, nagging me about homework. They Mm. they assumed I would do the right thing. Um, And as I progressed in education, I suppose to a a formal level beyond where where they had reached, they became even... um, less likely to offer advice or instruction. My father, on the other hand, while he was not at all directive about my education, loved to um, take hold of any certificates that I brought home from school Mm. uh, to show that I'd achieved anything. And these certificates would disappear for several days and we realised they were being shown round in the pub in the evening, (laughs) that Irish Mm. social habit so his Irish generation had a mm. social habit of going to the pub after work mm. uh, usually not for very long but for for one on the way home and um, these these certificates would be, would be passed around I, I still don't know what what commentary um, was given uh, I can only guess but they would they would come home slightly crumpled <laughs> or doggy at several days later but they were always returned <laughs> so I suppose that gave me a sense of um, uh, what's now called positive feedback mm. um, I think that was the term we used at the time uh, but we used to joke about it So they were both supportive parents and good parents They were The only time they influenced my educational choices and quite significantly so although I suppose in, in a way at the behest of someone else was when I reached the age of 11 the, the point of moving from primary school to, to a secondary school and this, of course, was the age of the 11 plus. Mm. So naturally, I went to the local Catholic primary school and uh, I took the 11 plus as, 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 as we did. I think I did quite well. I suddenly passed. I think it was mm. pass fail. Um, and um, my form teacher at school, who, who wasn't a Catholic, not all the teachers in the school were Catholics, mm. um, told my parents that I was very promising and I ought really to apply to go to the King Edward VI school in Edgbaston, which a was, very famous school. was a famous school with, with, with an excellent academic record, I think quite intensively academic. It was mm. a boys' school at the time. Um, mm. And um, the alternative was to go to the uh, boys' Catholic grammar schools in Phillips, attached to the Birmingham Oratory. Um, also a good school, but not as intensively academic as King Edward's, but Catholic. And... As I recall, my parents were not um, of a a strong view one way or the other, but the headmaster of my primary school, I I recall his name was Mr. Hennigan, he was another Irishman and uh, certainly a staunch Catholic, um, certainly informed my parents that I would risk burning in hell if I went to a (laughs) non-Catholic school. So I think my parents took the position that I really ought to go to St. Philip's, having been given this uh, Mm. firm advice by my primary school head teacher, so I, I duly went to St. Philip's and stayed mm. there until I did my A-levels mm. seven mm. years later. But I think that was their only decisive intervention in my, in my education, as I recall. I always ask people what their first memory was and at what age. Um, a clearish memory, not just sort of trees waving in the breeze above their mm. pram, but something early in their life that they remember. Do you have any early memory? If not, not to worry, but... Yes, I do. I have quite early memories. I think the earliest one, which I'm certain about, and which has um, 
a certain amount of detail and I, and I can still locate the exact spot where it occurred near near my what was my home in Birmingham uh, was indeed in my pram now whether I was a pram age or a little older and had climbed into a pram I'm, I'm not quite sure but I was certainly in a pram being pushed by my mother and um, I think I was sit I was kneeling or sitting up in the pram because I saw a dog sitting on the pavement directly blocking the pram on a narrow pavement and my mother slowed down and I remember saying to my mother run him over mom <laughs> um, I'm sure we didn't in fact, I, but I, it's, it's, it's a very short memory but I, I remember exactly where it was you I can see the dog the spot. Yeah. I can see the dog what kind of dog was it Michael? I can't describe the dog I know only that it was definitely a dog <laughs> of a medium size mm. and that it was squatting on the pavement directly in the path of my pram <laughs> that's nice you, so you were probably about three or four I would think not older than that. Mm. Um, do you might remember much about your primary school? Oh yes, I have quite detailed memories. Um, well, particularly that's about the age of six to... To eleven, yes. 11. Um, were there any teachers there who particularly uh, influenced you for the good or bad, do you remember? Yes, I, I remember two or three of my teachers reasonably well um, I remember that I, I liked school a lot mm. um, I went briefly to another school I think for a few weeks because there was no space at the at the Catholic school and I even remember that first school where I must have been when I was five and a half or something for a few weeks but I, it was so brief all I can remember is playing in the yard mm. um, but then I moved to the school where I spent all my primary years um, Saint Saint Saints Mary and John, um, in uh, in Gravelly Hill, Birmingham, which I think is still there. I pass mm. it occasionally when I go back to Birmingham to visit relatives. So it was a school um, right behind a, a large, then fairly modern, Catholic church. Um, while I was there, it expanded, and, and some new buildings were built on an adjacent plot and we spread out and I remember finishing my primary school in rather newer buildings um, but I started in the old buildings behind the um, behind the church um, I, what, what I particularly remember is that I enjoyed school a lot I think I was quite I was quite naughty um, I was quite good at most things that were academic, not good at games. Uh, I think it was just partly motivation and I, I, I've still got some of my old school reports from those days so I can look back mm -hmm. at, uh, at, at, at the documentary evidence and the reports generally tell a tale of someone who, who showed a brightness and interest in study but was quite hard to control, um, clumsy at games and um, sometimes too questioning for the liking of some teachers. I think it rather depends on the teacher whether that was seen as a, as a, as a virtue or a character flaw. <laughs> right. What, what, by that age, do you have any outside school hobbies and interests? Did you collect things or um, start any particular excitements at that stage? Yes, I did. I, I, I remember quite a lot of things I did other than um, go to school and go to home. It was about a mi one mile walk each way to and from school. One, one thing I recall well is that in, in, at that time it was quite normal to allow quite small children to walk on their own mm. some distance to school. and we, we never considered it to be a danger. Mm. Um, I, I mention that because I, I, I link those things to what I think is the development of independence mm. which I think is quite an important thing to develop and I mm. you know, tried, tried to follow that with, with, with our own children um, but the things I remember doing, well I, I remember playing a lot I had a number of friends um, mostly a little older than me but only one year above me at school and, and some from other schools because they weren't Catholics, some were but they lived in the, in the neighbouring streets around mm. our house and we used to spend a lot of time building dens, trespassing in other people's garden. 
stealing uh, fruit, stealing fruit um, <laughs> scrumping as we call it, mm. stealing apples. Um, Fishing? Uh, yes, we, we, we used to fish a little and catch tadpoles. Mm. Um, when we got a bit bigger, we used to trek to Sutton Park, which is about three miles away, I suppose, three mm. or four miles. As we didn't have much money, we'd usually walk the distance, mm. occasionally take the train. But Sutton Park was wonderful. It's a, it's a, I think it's the remnants of a royal hunting ground on the fringes mm. of Birmingham, and mm. the miles of fairly natural woodland and bog mm. and gorse bush bushes. And it, it, was, it was a paradise for young kids, mm. certainly kids like me at the time. Uh, uh, in you know in 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 our sort of micro world, it was the equivalent of you know, being on the Great Savannah or something to go to go to Sutton Park. It extended further than you were likely to go, so mm. it was effectively limitless to mm. to someone of age eleven or twelve, I suppose, when we, when we used to sneak off there for, the, for hours on end. I remember that. I remember joining the Cub Scouts. Mm. In fact, the Cub Hut was sandwiched between the school building and the church. Um, and um, I, I remember getting my uniform and my uh, paraphernalia that you have to buy um, to be a Cub Scout. I think my mother always found it a stretch when I needed something else bought um, that would cost money you know, outside the normal weekly household budget, but you know, she, she would only oblige me if she thought it was necessary. Um, so I was in the Cubs for Unfortunately, I, before I progressed to the Scouts, somebody burnt the hut down and, and no one could find the money to build a new one. So I never got very far um, in, in, uh, in Baden-Powell's organisation. Um, another thing I did, I suppose from about the age of, I don't know, 12, 13, um, I became an altar server in our Catholic church. I'm not quite sure why, because I think I was particularly poor at it um, so I would bear candles do other things to assist at, uh, at mass and other services I was so bad at it that I was eventually um, dismissed um, for repeated errors of behaviour uh, which I think were partly careless and partly um, deliberate mischief making but I, I did find it very boring <laughs> odd you did it <laughs> I'm still not sure why I did. Probably because my friends did. Oh, I can't. I don't feel any. I don't remember any other impetus to do it. Mm. I don't remember my parents pressing me to do it either. But I, I think probably someone I knew did it, and mm. you go along with your mates. Yeah. Then you went on to this uh, Catholic grammar school um, from twelve to. I think I was eleven when I started. Eleven to eighteen. Yes. Um, do you remember any of the teachers there particularly who influenced you? Yes, much more so. Um, uh, it was a big big change in life going to grammar school. For one thing, I had to cross the city every day and I, I got a free bus pass from the city council and could ride, ride across Birmingham, Ohio, which I rather enjoyed. It gave me a great sense of independence. In my first year, I had a very peculiar form teacher who was also our maths teacher, he was an Irishman by the name of Butler. Um, I, I, I presume he'd been in England some time, but he, he certainly still spoke as, a, as an Irishman. Um, but he was quite a disciplinarian um, in that uh, we would hand in our maths homework and then he would lay out the homework in three piles when he'd marked it. Mm. And he would say, this is the pile that I'm satisfied with. And it was usually a very a very low pile, <laughs> and then then there'd be another pile on the other side of the desk. This, this is this is the pile that are, that, are, that are going to get whacked. This was just the I suppose the last period in which um, corporal punishment was not only allowed but it was this is widely used. Mm. Um, and then then there was a larger pile in the middle, and he would say, "Well, these are the ones that are um, just about satisfactory." but I think I'm going to whack you anyway. Um, this, is, this is based on the Catholic co cosmology, isn't it? It's purgatory, yes. hell and uh, paradise. <laughs> well, in, indeed so. But of course, you could, you could play this story if you wanted to as an example of um, 
you know, our minds being bent out of shape at an impressionable age by, by, by terrible abuse, and there's been mm-hmm. plenty of that in the world. But I, I can't say that this instance had that impact, certainly on me, and as far as I know, not on the others. Were you whacked often? Well, it became a badge of honour to get whacked <laughs> frequently. Um, what, so we, what were you whacked with, and for how many whacks? He, he would he would whack with a um, with an old gym shoe, which he called Excalibur. <laughs> um, so he he, he 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 obviously tried to terrify us. But as I recall, we used to vie with each other to provoke him in order to gain kudos with our friends by being whacked. <laughs> in, in front of the class mm. uh, I think he got wise to this so he didn't actually do it I think all that often only when he was in the mood mm. um, but not, none of us really took it seriously we thought it was all, all jolly good fun <laughs> um, I, I think it's not for, I, I, I don't approve of it at all but it wasn't, I, it wasn't particularly painful or, I suppose it couldn't have been very painful mm. um, six of the best was it or? yeah I suppose about, mm. about that uh, so um, you wondered which pile you were in. Were you usually in the middle pile or...? I think I was usually in the OK pile because I was mm. quite good in maths. Mm. So I had to resort to other means to ensure I got a reasonable number of whackings <laughs> so that I wasn't seen as a um, as teacher's pet. <laughs> um, so that's the first year. And then as you proceeded, did you go up the classical side or the science side? Um, I, was, I was quite keen on both. So I did um, I did O levels in um, uh, certainly in physics and chemistry. I don't think I did O level in biology. Uh, no, I didn't. I did and I did O level maths. Of course, that was compulsory. But I also, in addition to French, which was compulsory, I took German from the age of fourteen, which was an, an option. You didn't have to do another language. You could do other things. Um, Latin. I did Latin for a couple of years, but I dropped it because you couldn't do Latin and German. They're the mm. bizarre rules. I rather like Latin, but I like German more. Mm. Um, I think I possibly I could have done Latin, but then I wouldn't have been able to do a, a plausible science mm. uh, range of subjects. And I was quite interested in science, and I wasn't sure whether I'd prefer mm. later to, con- to continue with science or humanities. So I, try, I suppose I tried to keep my options open by, by spreading it out a bit. Um, but I enjoyed all my subjects except um, um, religious instruction, which was compulsory, which I found um, quite boring. But then I, I didn't, didn't care for the teacher. That was probably mm. one of the reasons. Um, but also I didn't like you know, what I've now learned, later learned to call the curriculum. Mm. Um, it, it seemed that the, or the syllabus at that time seemed to consist almost entirely of memorization of passages mm. from the Bible mm. with, with, with not very interesting interpretation um, so I think that was the problem more than the subject matter I don't think I was particularly anti-religious at that age uh, I think I just found the idea of a subject which consisted of learning passages by heart mm. um, uh, very unengaging for me. Mm. Well, that brings up religion because you were presumably confirmed, were you? At, oh, I was, yes. At 13, 14? Yes. Sort of age? Yes. Um, quite a lot of people go through their most religious period yes. sometime around confirmation and a few years afterwards. Did that happen to you or not? No, I, I, I never had a strong religious um, enthusiasm. period of enthusiasm in my life. Um, my parents were always um, good Catholics in the mm. sense that they not only went to church, they also um, were I suppose, pretty good examples in most respects mm. of following the, the moral tenets of the church. Uh, on the other hand, they never gave me any evidence of a deep um, philosophical or theological Mm -hmm. commitment. I don't know if that's because they didn't have one or they couldn't articulate it or they didn't want to foist it on me. I'm I'm not sure, but I I rather think it was because they were Catholics um, in the same way that whole populations adhere to a faith because Mm -hmm. everybody else does. Mm -hmm. 
but that's something I've um, I suppose intellectually struggled with not just intellectually I don't really find it easy to understand because I, I've noticed quite a lot of people are like me mm. in that they tend to take opposite positions to the majority around them as often as not mm. or certainly not feel under any obligation to fall in with with majority opinion uh, and that's been my observation it's certainly my, my self observation and yet I also see situations now and in the past where our whole populations at least appear to adhere automatically to whatever the prevailing tenets of faith are mm. and I rather think my parents were Catholics in, in that way mm. uh, I do recall one conversation with my father around sort of the awkward period um, I think it was probably between the age of 16 and 18 that I started sometimes to be um, uh, arsy about it and sometimes mm. deliberately make um, anti-religious or anti-Catholic statements to see how my, my, my parents would react or indeed my teachers. I think I did it there as well at school. And I, I remember once saying to my father, so tell me one good reason why we should be Catholics. And I remember his reply, he said, well, you tell me a better religion. <laughs> and I, I, uh, it's difficult to argue with, with, with that. Um, but I can never recall my parents trying to argue um, in, 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 in an academic way mm. in favour of the, the, of, of, the, of the Catholic faith. Um, nor did they uh, try to sanction me or put any real pressure on me when I made it clear, which I did by about the age of 18, that I was going to have nothing more to do with it. Were you going to confessions with this period? I must have been going to confession up to the age of 18 probably up to the age of 18 yes um, I do recall um, genuinely feeling the sense of guilt that comes um, from um, disobeying the tenets of the church whereas I don't recall ever having faith mm. and, and my particular recollection of feeling guilt is when I once inadvertently missed Sunday Mass. I always went to Mass on Sunday. It was drilled into you. That was one of the absolute rules that you mm. had to go to Mass on every Sunday of your life. And I once missed it. I think I'd maybe been on some school trip that overlapped the weekend and I was supposed to... I, I don't know what happened, but I remember realising on Monday that I hadn't been to Mass on Sunday and no one had noticed. And I felt absolutely terrible. Mm. But I, I think that, that, that I then reacted to that. I can't remember if it was the, the, the next day or possibly two or three years later. I don't really don't <laughs> know. But it, it eventually triggered a different reaction, which was, you know, what an awful business this, this Catholicism is that I should feel bad just because I inadvertently failed to go to a church service on a Sunday. So I think it rather fed my... Um, my um, eagerness to, to get away from all that. Yes, well you mentioned at 18 you told your parents that you were no longer going to be a Catholic or go to Mass or whatever. What Did something trigger that and why did you suddenly or fairly suddenly change? Um, was it intellectual doubts or was it boring or what? I think that it's... Um, I think there was there was quite a long period, possibly from the age of fifteen or sixteen, mm -hmm. where I was rather sure that I didn't I didn't believe the tenets of faith, um, and um, I, mean, I didn't I didn't uh, disagree or agree fully with the with with the with the, with the codes of behaviour mm -hmm. promoted by the church or rather demanded by the church, but I didn't believe the tenets of faith themselves. Uh, I didn't believe the catechism um, and um, I think that period went on despite the fact that I continued to practice I was at a Catholic grammar school where we had regular religious events I was in the choir mm -hmm. so you went to all services in the choir I actually think I joined the choir partly so that I would have a uh, a more interesting time at the compulsory religious services because at least I'd have something to do mm. um, and a chance to show off a bit rather than just having to, to, to sort of endure 
the ritual. Um, so I think it sort of ran on, on on autopilot for a couple of years, but not not just that. I think that despite the fact that I didn't believe, I was apprehensive of what um, punishment I might face um, if I were to abandon the whole thing without being absolutely sure. So I think there was a process of two years of, I don't know, maturation, uh, maybe some reflection, and a feeling at the age of 18 that it was it was really a cop-out to go on practicing something that you really hadn't believed in for as long as you remembered thinking about it. Before that, you probably hadn't thought about it much. So I suppose there was a sort of sense of growing sense of pride, uh, if you like, or feeling that intellectual honesty compelled me to, um, to, to, to live as I thought, mm. rather than simply live as I'd been told to. Or to pretend to believe because it would please other people or uh, because there might be some um, unforeseen and calculable punishment ahead. So I, I, I just vaguely remember one day, uh, actually I remember when it was, it was on the, once a week we had um, compulsory PE at school and we had to walk about a mile to the school playing field, which was a separate site. And I remember it was on one of those afternoon walks to the school playing field. And I think for once I was walking on my own, I usually walked with, with, with classmates. And I remember thinking, that's it. I'm not going to go on pretending anymore. I'm going to refuse to go to mass because absolutely no reason to go. It's no good to anyone to go there if you don't actually believe. And I'm not going to go to confession anymore. Confession was the worst thing, of course, because you had to come up with something to say. <laughs> and I, I found it very difficult to confess to sins that... Um, and it wasn't hard to think of sins um, that you'd actually committed, since so many things counted as sin. Uh, if, if failing all else, you could usually confess to impure thoughts. Mm. Um, but I, I just felt it was dishonest to reel these things off to the priest through the screen when I didn't really feel any sense of guilt. I certainly didn't think there was anything wrong with having impure thoughts. I had come to regard it as inevitable at <laughs> certain stages of life. Um, so I, I, I remember the moment when I made the decision that I was no longer going to go along with it. Um, again, it's odd, it's rather like the, the, the experience with the dog on the pavement. I can remember the exact point on the exact street. I think I could find the place. Um, where, where, where that occurred to me that that, that decision um, formed in my head mm, and what about was this before you went to university was, you were still at school oh yes I was still at school and what about since Have you? how would you classify yourself now I would classify myself um, agnostic or um, atheist or that Catholic or what? Probably somewhere between agnostic and atheist. I'm sorry to fudge it like that. <laughs> um, but um, agnostic to me suggests that you um, regard it as a sort of 50% probability mm. that there's some, some form of deity mm. out there, up there or around here. Mm. And 50% there isn't. And since you can't settle the matter either way, you sort of call yourself agnostic. Um, Atheist, I think, to me, is, is, is right on the other end, uh, on the end of the spectrum. It's mm. denying any possibility mm. of a deity. So I call myself uh, between, the, I place myself between the two because I'd say that the chances that, of, of any of these faiths having any kind of basis in truth or, or, mm. or, or the being any truth in the notion of an afterlife is less than 50%. Mm. But I, mm. I feel it would be arrogant to, to, to state that the possibility is zero. Very good. Okay, well, let, now let's move on to uh, university. How how did you choose to go to Oxford, or why did you choose to go to Oxford? Well, I was... Um, did you have a gap year, by the way, or not? I did have a gap year, yes. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was a somewhat inevitable gap year because of uh, the decision to try and get into Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, most... Um, boys, it was a boys school that I went to, although I think in my last year there we admitted a few girls mm. into the sixth form, um, didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, mm. uh, but in most years 
I think one or two or three or four would, would, would get in and um, uh, most didn't apply but quite a lot applied to university I think um, but I, I was doing quite well I did well in my O levels I mean well academically and um, I, st- and I, I was on course to get good grades in A levels which I, d- I did get and I remember one teacher particularly who wasn't actually my teacher who was just someone I knew because he was a teacher of some of my friends in the school he was an economics teacher but I think he'd been to Oxford um, and he particularly said, oh, you know, you've got a very good chance of getting into Oxford or Cambridge and you ought to give it a try. And I was quite um, influenced by that advice because um, I mean, no, no one in my immediate family had ever been to university. Um, none of my uncles, aunts, cousins had been to university. Um, Around the time that I went to Oxford, one of my Irish cousins joined the Jesuit training program in Dublin. So we started, but we were the first on either side of the family, um, you know, within, within sort of first cousin distance to go near a university. So I had no no one to follow, uh, no inside information from the family. But um, a good friend who was at school with me the same year, someone I still know similar background to me, although both his parents were Irish, but a Birmingham boy like me, he was also given similar advice, and I always regarded him as um, more clued up than I was. I'm not sure why, because he came from a very similar background, but he seemed to be good at working out what the advantages of any course of action were. So he told me, uh, yeah, this is a really good idea. They said the same thing to me, but I, he said, I've, I've looked into it, and if we go to Oxford or Cambridge and do reasonably well, we'll get paid lots of money <laughs> for, uh, and have relatively easy lives, or words to that effect. He, he, he'd done a sort of um, uh, cost-benefit analysis and concluded this was, was, was much the best thing we could possibly do. So I was partly influenced by that as well. It, 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 uh, it sounded quite interesting. I had no idea how to differentiate between Oxford and Cambridge. Mm. So... Um, I sort of looked at the map and decided Oxford was a better bet because my father hated long drives mm. and I thought he'd be more willing to take me to Oxford because he'd be able to get back the same day. Mm. Was the, there was no A14 dual carriageway in those days, so it took quite a long time to drive from Birmingham to Cambridge, much mm. longer than twice as long as driving from Birmingham to Oxford. So that, that was the only reason for preferring Oxford. To me, they were completely mm. interchangeable. Um, I also had no idea about colleges mm. and um, no one particularly advised me about colleges so I, I, I got hold of the prospectus mm. which I remember was a sort of black and white thing the Oxford University prospectus and you had a college a couple of pages per college with one, pic, one black and white photo and I closed my eyes and flicked the pages <laughs> and it opened on Brazenose and then I read it and learnt that it was one of the few, I think there were about four men's colleges that had already started admitting women. Mm. And I thought well, that sounds quite good. I was, I was rather fed up being in an all-boys school. Mm. So, so Brazenose it was, and I, I applied for, for Brazenose on that basis, not, not, not for any other. And they, they let me in. But um, at that time you had to take the, um, the entrance exam, mm which was in, I think it was in November each mm. year. And I think in some private schools, they would accelerate children and put them in their upper sixth year mm. um, to the entrance exam. But at my school, that wasn't, that, that wasn't really available. We wouldn't have been prepared well. But the school did say that um, if you were applying to Oxford or Cambridge, there were never many of us we should come back after A levels for one for, uh, for most of the term, and they would give us some extra preparation classes. So we had to do it in I think it was called seventh term, which meant effectively you had to take the rest of the year as a gap year. Mm. So that that's why I had a gap year. In the end, I had a full gap year because um, after the summer vacation following my A levels, I only went back to school for a week, mm. and then decided I couldn't bear it anymore. It was one of those, I think, quite unexpected things because I'd been very settled mm. at my grammar school up to that point. I'd never felt the need to 
get away from it I found it quite engaging I, yeah. I, I did A levels in German and French and maths and general studies and I found it all quite interesting and I did well but um, only a week or so after coming back to work towards the Oxford entrance exam I, I, I just suddenly decided I couldn't bear going to school and sitting in a school desk and being a schoolboy. I don't think they even required us to wear uniforms at that stage and I didn't dislike my teachers it was some sort of resistance to being institutionalised any longer um, so I went home and announced that I wasn't going to go to university I'd changed my mind I needed to get out and get a job you have much idea what and I still don't know what it was that led me to rebel against myself mm. I say against myself because there was no one certainly not my parents who was compelling me to follow this particular course of action it was a rebellion against myself um, but I went off and got a job to fill in time as a, as a, as a casual waiter actually I think I had that job already as a sort of weekend occasional evening job over the summer because I, I always needed to work to have any, any money uh, so I, I just asked for more hours um, <coughs> carried on working and thinking about what I would actually do with the rest of my life <coughs> but um, the time came round for the entrance exam to be sat and I'd, I had been entered for it mm. before rebelling <coughs> and the school didn't withdraw me from the exam despite my refusing to go there anymore and I, I wasn't sure whether I should actually take it or not um, I wasn't I think I was afraid of taking it I just wasn't sure there was any point but I met up with the, the friend I mentioned the, the, who also went to Oxford <coughs> I remember we went out to a pub in the centre of Birmingham the one that well, was underneath the, the old central library the inverted ziggurat that was demolished recently and we went, went into that pub underneath I forget the name now and we drank too much and we emerged from the pub having made a pact that if, if you do it, I'll do it. I think my friend recapped his economic case for going to Oxford that it would guarantee an easy life. Mm. Um, but I think, in, I don't know in the end what, what, what led to the pact being concluded, probably alcohol. But anyway, the pact was concluded. So the following week we went in and, and sat the entrance exam. Uh, so I went back to school for however many hours it took to, to write my papers. And... Um, I suppose I didn't feel under any pressure at all because I wasn't really sure I wanted to do any of this anyway. Um, but then a few weeks later, I was, well, I suppose a few days, I don't remember, a month maybe, I was summoned to Brasenose for an interview. Um, so I went down to Oxford on the train to see what it's like. And I, I quite liked it. They put me up for one night in college and I had a couple of interviews and um, they, they let me in um, they, they gave me what was it called an open exhibition which I think was slightly better than just getting in mm. I think it meant you got a longer gown and a slightly better room in your first year which was something um, but I, I was actually quite surprised that they, that they took me and you went on with the waiting for the rest of the year no I didn't um, I'd, before I um, started rebelling, in fact just before I'd um, filled in an application to an organisation called the, the Central Bureau for Education Visits and Exchanges and asked if I could go to France from January till the summer as, a, as an English language assistant it was as available for uh, gap year students who were about mm. to study modern languages mm. that you could go and be an assistant teacher as a native speaker and um, that, that came through I think they called me down to London for an interview and um, assigned me to a, to a secondary school in Toulouse in France so I spent January till June mm -hmm. um, living in a school in France and, and, and working there which I rather enjoyed mm -hmm. I mean, it was a bit lonely at times because I, I lived in a, a cavernous lycée that was empty at the weekends mm -hmm. uh, of almost all human souls uh, the workload was light 
but I had a very good time. I think I had three day weekends and I used to hitchhike all over the south of France. And it was, it was quite good for sort of learning to actually speak French. Mm. And I, I quite enjoyed that. Um, so it's it actually, actually quite, a, quite a pleasant rest of gap year. Much better than pouring wine in a hotel in Birmingham. <laughs> and then um, the last phase we'll do this part, which is uh, Oxford. Um, you read German and French. Were there any inspiring teachers you remember from that period? Yeah, I, I found the whole program very engaging, very interesting. I, I, I enjoyed Oxford a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very big change for me. What year was it that you went? I went up in 1978. Yeah. Um, to to Brazenose. Um my main tutors were, were Richard Cooper, who's still there as an emeritus fellow, and the late Raymond Lucas in, in German. Um, I got on well with both of them, they were both very interesting, they gave good tutorials. Um, I went out to other colleges occasionally when I took a paper that was outside their, their area, so I did some linguistics at another college, did some um, 20th century French literature, which meant going to another college. Um, I, I didn't go to very many lectures. I spent more time in the library reading. I read. I read a lot within my subject and around my subject when I was at Oxford. Um, fortunately, I suppose for my for my academic prospects, I rediscovered my my self discipline and, and unrebelled during the summer before I went to Oxford. I, one thing I recall is that. Um, I spent the summer before I went up to Oxford, after I came back from France, actually mostly living with, with a then girlfriend in uh, her family in, in Suffolk, and she was about to go to another university. But what I recall is that um, I received a reading list from Oxford early in the summer, and I, I went out, got all the books. I think I probably came to Cambridge and got them, we were in Suffolk, yeah, that's right. and. Um, I read them all. I read everything on the reading list because I thought you would, what you, you really should do uh, was the reading list. <laughs> and I remember when I actually arrived at Brazenose, I was one of the only ones who, who, who would admit to having read everything on the reading <laughs> list. Some people hadn't quite got round to it or they'd had too much to do over the summer. So I think I got off to quite a good start uh, having read a lot of the material already, uh, which I think helps a lot because mm. I realised you have to read a great deal every week doing 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 a modern languages program at Oxford, I dare say you still do. Um, so I did well in prelims, which were the exams after two terms. Mm. Um, I think I worked less hard in my second year. I got into all sorts of other, um, you know, ge ge generally quite sound activities, but not academic, and um, put in a bit of a spurt in my, my final year, because I was a bit worried of, about doing very badly. Um, but I, I really enjoyed Oxford. Um, I love the. I actually really liked the literature that we, we studied, or most of it, because we studied more or less what we liked. That was the thing about Oxford compared to school. You more or less did what you liked. There were so many choices. So I, I, I after after the first two terms, when there was a fairly set program, I, I studied the things that I thought were interesting. And outside of study, I did the things I liked. I discovered I actually liked sport. I hated sport until I went to Oxford. Um, and I liked it at Oxford because it was entirely optional. So I discovered I quite enjoyed cross-country running and rowing. But I was very resistant to it, any, any kind of... Did you row for the college? Sport. I did, yes. Only for the mm. second boat, but mm. I rowed for two years. Mm. Gave it up in my final year. Mm. To concentrate on on study, I suppose. I did a lot of music at Oxford as well. I I learned to play the cello uh, from about the age of eleven or twelve mm -hmm. um, under the influence of a musical friend. My, my mm -hmm. family wasn't musical, um, and the, the grammar school lent me a cello and provided a teacher. Um, so by the time I got to Oxford, I could play reasonably well, and I played in the university orchestra. And I played a lot of chamber music. Um, so I had quite, quite, a, quite a rich musical life for most of the time I was at Oxford and was also very involved in, in sport. Mm. Um, in politics at all? 
No, I, I stayed right out of student politics. It, it didn't interest me. Um, apart from one shouting match with members of the the, the Monday Club who who woke me up one night, mm. having a raucous meeting across the corridor. I don't recall any other encounter with student politics. And you mentioned music. Um, has music continued to be important for you through your life? Yes, it has. Um, these days, I don't. I don't play. Um, although I always tell myself when I've got more time, I'll, I'll get my cello out of the loft. But I, I sing with Wolfson Choir mm -hmm. every week in term, so I do keep music up. Mm. Telling me about the importance of music in your life, and I was asking about whether there were any particular uh, composers or types of music that you listen to a lot. Yes, I, I, I most love the um, the classical period, mm -hmm. um, but also the 19th century romantics. I suppose my, my interests have got somewhat wider, but I still much prefer those uh, those periods. When I was about 15 or 16 and at grammar school in Birmingham, I was so enthused by this music. Uh, we played little bits of it in the school orchestra and I was doing O-level music, so we did some in, some appreciation. But I would um, buy the recordings on vinyl records from Woolworths or W.H. Smith, and then I would go and borrow the, score, the full score from the Birmingham Central Library that had quite a good collection of orchestral scores. And I would sit for hours um, just listening to the music and relating it to the score in front of me. Um, so I became, you know, to whatever purpose, quite knowledgeable about the sort of second clarinet part in the second movement of. I, 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 there was no need to know such things in such detail, but I, I just found it very interesting. I, I love musical scores as I love maps. Um, those, those are two things that have always really appealed to me, um, e even though my field was languages. Well, maybe there are maps in languages, but we'll come back to that. Um, so let's take us to the end of your undergraduate course. What You got a reasonable degree? I did. I got a first. I was mm. quite surprised. Mm. Uh, I think I took the right options and uh, you know, things I was relatively good at. Um, but I, I remember finals as being quite an ordeal. Was that the really hard thing was remembering texts in sufficient detail to quote from them mm. when, when dealing with most of the papers were, were about literature, but um, I, I don't know, I, I'm probably quite good at exams in that I, I think I'm quite good at writing structured essays and making a little knowledge go a long way. Um, so I, I, I got through them anyway and was, was pleased and surprised when, when they gave me a first. And then what did you do? Um, well, before I took finals at Oxford, I gave some thought to the question of what to do next. I think it was suggested that if I did well enough I might want to stay on and do postgraduate studies, but I really felt the need to move on. I thought you know, I had a good three years at Oxford and a, a year abroad in Germany in the middle, but I didn't want to spend any more time at university at, certainly at that point in my life, um, but nor had, any, had I any idea what, what, what sort of job I might do. Um, so I didn't actively look for a job in my last year. I didn't go. To, I don't think I went to any milk round mm. events in Oxford, even though I could easily have done so. I think it was because I I wasn't so much against any particular job, against doing any particular job. I just found it impossible to see how I could possibly, how I could commit myself to any repetitive form of work for the rest of my life. Because I I think the way we thought then was that whatever you choose to do, you'll probably do that until you retire. It's what most people did. They went into the BBC or they went into the diplomatic service or they went into banking and then that's what you did. And I just felt it was impossible for me at that point to make such a, a, a long-term momentous choice. So um, one, one notion I had was that I lacked experience of the world. Um, I'd only lived in the UK and uh, a few months in France, uh, slightly longer in Germany in my year abroad, but I'd never been to a uh, poor country, uh, what we, we used to call them developing countries, uh, the third world, that's what we used to call it, and never been to the third world, uh, never been outside Europe, 
Um, so I, I, I heard about VSO, Voluntary Service Overseas, which in those days used to uh, quite commonly send fresh graduates out to developing countries as, as teachers and, and other things, but particularly as teachers. So I, I got hold of an application pack and filled it in. And I, I don't recall that you were asked to say where you wanted to go. You were merely asked to say what you wanted to do and why. Um, so I filled it in and was called for an interview sometime before I took my finals in, in Oxford, in, in London. Um, and I remember a couple of sort of bearded chaps interviewed me and asked me a lot of questions that seemed designed to elicit my interest in development. Uh, my, the sincerity of my, my, my application, as it were. Um, I'd rather been hoping that if I landed a job, it would be in a, a, um, a Pacific atoll with nice weather all the year round and nice beach. And I would sort of contemplate the meaning of life and have a jolly good time. Uh, that, was, that was roughly what I had in mind, if anything. <laughs> But in, in the interview, they, 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 they ambushed me with a question, um, would you like to be part of our, our pilot program in China that we recently started? And I had no idea about China. It wasn't at all what I had in mind. Um, I think my, my image of China then, such as it was, uh, related to my stamp collecting hobby when I was a young child I, for a few years. I didn't keep it up for very long. I collected stamps, I suppose, when I was about nine or ten. And I remembered the Chinese stamps that I'd got hold of, which had pictures of red guards waving little red books at Chairman Mao, <laughs> in sort of socialist realist style. And that was my image of China. It sounded pretty grim. Um, but I, I suppose I wasn't very up to date about China. In fact, I was very ignorant about China. Um, but confronted with this question what went through my head was that if I don't answer with some enthusiasm they'll simply conclude I'm not seriously interested in volunteering I'm just sort of looking for um, uh, a cushy number somewhere so I rather faked enthusiasm thinking I had nothing to lose and um, was duly offered a, a, a two-year assignment to um, central south China came through a few weeks later <coughs> and um, it wasn't what I had in mind, but by then I'd, I'd had a chance to reflect a bit, and I thought, well, maybe learning Chinese will be useful. It would certainly be interesting, because it sounds really hard. I, I had one friend at Brazenos who was doing Oriental Studies, and she'd explained to me a little bit about Chinese characters, and I was, I was just so impressed that she could read these things and <laughs> learn to do so at Oxford in a year. It, that, that, that was quite, 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 um, quite tantalizing. Um, so I, I decided to do it. I think I, I responded positively, but I wasn't really sure that I wanted to do it. I thought possibly I would back out before the time came two or three months later to actually get on the plane. But what I think confirmed me in my intention to go was that after I'd accepted the offer and received more details of the work I was going to do, I think I got a report written by someone in the British Council who'd been sent down to vet the place where I was about to be sent, uh, described it as um, um, a um, an oasis of urban squalor in a desert of rural backwardness. <laughs> this is a, um, British cultural diplomat in Beijing at the time. Um, and I rather liked the sound of that. I thought that sounds really interesting. <laughs> and then I got a letter, um, first letter in my life that I'd ever received from China. It was covered in postage stamps because in those days you could only buy very, very, very low value stamps in China for, because domestic postage was so cheap. Hardly anyone ever sent a letter abroad. So when you did, you had to buy enough stamps to cover the whole back of the envelope in order to reach the, <laughs> the, the price of, a, of an airmail letter. So I received this intriguing letter, a, a thin airmail envelope, the, the back covered in stamps and the front with my address copied out. It was a letter from the VSO volunteer who was then at the college that I was about to go to. She had been the first one there. She'd been there one year. Um, and it was a letter telling me um, in rather cranky language at great length why I should on no account accept the offer. Um, because she said she was being spied on, having a rotten time, um, 
place was um, terrible. I was judged by the way she wrote the letter. It had certainly had an impact on her, unless she was already in a bad way before she went there. But I, I, the more I, I, I read this letter several times, as, 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 as you might imagine, and it really enthused me. I thought this sounds so terrible. I really got to go. I have to see this for myself. It, it, it made something that might have seemed a bit boring or remote seem really, really interesting if, if for negative reasons. <laughs> so I, I, I went off to China with some enthusiasm. I, I was given the SO arranged, I think it was a three week training course in teaching English, which I had a little experience from having done it in Germany. Um, and a two week course, I think it was, in the basics of Chinese. And then I was put on a plane to uh, Beijing and met and taken on to Hunan with one other volunteer. From, from England and um, we were placed together in this college um, and I had a very interesting two years actually where was the college it was in in Hunan province yes, in where a was city Wuhan? Called, uh, no it was a city called Shangtan Shangtan X-I-N-G-T-A-N yeah quite well known in China simply because Chairman Mao was born in, so it's in near Wuhan. Changsha it's very near Changsha about 30 miles south of Changsha so it's near where he was born yeah, his village is within the county of Shantan, so uh -huh. he's considered to be from Shantan, yeah. um, which is its uh, main the main reason it's quite well known in China. But it's a, it's a sort of medium-sized industrial city mm. in the middle of, a, a, of the rice belt mm. of central China. And I was at an interesting time because China was just... 80, 82. 82, yes. Chinese had just started to seek foreign teachers in large numbers to teach English. So it's policy of, of um, uh, teaching everybody English so I, I was involved in, in training students who would become English teachers and also helping middle-aged language teachers improve their English in some cases they'd been trained to be Russian teachers but now needed mm. to retrain as English teachers so I had quite a mixture of students of different ages and backgrounds which was very very interesting. Did you like the Chinese? Yes, I did. I have to say it was very weird at first. I was obviously unprepared. I'd never been to Asia. I'd never been to a, a, a socialist country. Mm. Um, and I think for the first three months I endured some form of culture shock. I wasn't depressed, but I, I used to sleep an inordinate amount of the time, even you know, so if I taught from 9 till 11, I'd then go back to bed and sleep for two or three hours until my next class. So I think it was about three months before I started to um, follow normal sleep rhythms mm -hmm. and begin to find a sort of normality in life. What, what shocked you or surprised you most about it? Well, many things shocked me. Um, the complete lack of privacy or of any value placed on privacy uh, in China at that time was quite striking. Um, so um, people constantly talked about other people and interfered in other people's lives. Um, I recall the first time I went to see the doctor at the college clinic because I was feeling unwell with a, with a, with a minor stomach complaint. Um, I was shocked, it was the only time I was shocked because it soon became normal when the whole leadership of the college turned up a few hours later to commiserate and they all had obviously been briefed on my symptoms in great detail where <laughs> I was used to the idea of medical confidentiality that certainly didn't exist in mm. in China um, but you in that in that position in a, you know, in a small town in China in a Chinese unit that wasn't used particularly to dealing with foreigners you were so bomb were so bombarded with the <coughs> unedited realities of Chinese life that after a time it became normal. Mm. It took about three months, I think. Have a, have a sip Thanks. of water. Um, the privacy also is that people <coughs> just come into your room and you know assume anyone can go anywhere. Well, that was the thing. I, I was given, uh, I have to say, I, I was given a, I, what I thought was a rather large apartment. I mean, Oxford was quite good and I had mm. my own room which I, I rarely did in Birmingham. But uh, China was better in that I got a, a, a small apartment mm. with, I think, three rooms. Mm. Um, it was rather basically equipped, um, but, uh, but nevertheless quite spacious. 
but I was I was given a colour television which only I and the other foreign teacher had everyone else had black and white TVs they were just new thing I think they'd sent someone to Shanghai especially to buy a colour television it wasn't a lot of use to me because there were I think two channels and they were both kind of awful propaganda and very monotonous mm. singing performances um, but it was nevertheless colour and it was enormously popular with young children on the campus and I would find that um, almost every evening around six o'clock there would be a tapping on my door and there'd be a gaggle of small Chinese children usually with snotty noses and um, in winter they'd come in their sort of pad- padded and slightly malodorous clothes because they'd been out in the rain and mm-hmm. um, generally in need of a wash and they'd say very politely in Chinese, can we, can we watch the television, please? Um, I rather suspected, as it was, I, I got, a, a, I think, a bit more insightful about society that their parents often encouraged them to do this in order to get them off their hands for a few hours because <laughs> they, they lived in very cramped conditions. Um, but as the, as the flat was spacious and I had no interest in watching television, I would simply leave them with the television in one room and go and mark books or do lesson preparation or, or learn Chinese mm-hmm. uh, as I spent quite a lot of time doing that in, in another room and they, they'd be there until I would uh, no one ever came to get them back I would sort of shoo them out at about 10 o'clock and they would go off quite quite happily uh, but anything like that everyone knew what was happening there were, there were no secrets mm. um, but I, I rather liked it it was quite nice to have the, uh, have the company mm. Did you make friends with Chinese? Yes, yes, we did to some extent. The um, one of our classes, they would come there for a year. So we had two of these classes, as it was a two-year assignment. Were um, many members were around my own age or a little bit older, and a few middle-aged people. And these were qualified teachers who'd been sent for retraining for various reasons to improve their knowledge of English. And because they were adults and some of them are in age, we used to socialise quite a lot. So a couple of times a week they would come along and, and drink beer, uh, which we'd provide for them. And occasionally we organised dances, uh, occasionally we went on trips out together. Um, so that was quite nice socially. And then there were a couple of staff in the college. If an individual Chinese um, sought to cultivate a sort of special relationship, close friendship with the foreigners. They were at great risk of being criticised. Um, not that we were seen negatively, but it would have been seen as too individualistic, trying to stand out too much. So the very small number that wanted to do that and saw an opportunity and were welcome to do so, from my point of view, used to sneak in after dark because the campus had no lighting outside mm. and even the internal lighting was quite quite dim it was relatively easy to sneak around after dark uh, e- even even on a Chinese campus um, without people necessarily knowing where you'd been so there was a certain, certain amount of that but mostly it was group socialising where, where people were of course much safer as they wouldn't, that would be approved mm. uh, the class monitor would report back if necessary but people weren't going to get in, in trouble for socialising as a, as a group with us um, so it was it was socially okay I was quite busy I spent a lot of time learning Chinese I had did a, you enjoy that? Oh, I loved it yes and I loved going out and using it mm-hmm. um yeah, I, I initially asked for a teacher, um, but I found there were a couple of problems with, with, with getting a teacher. One was that everyone spoke with a, with a Hunan dialect, and I thought I'd better try and learn standard mm. Mandarin pronunciations so that would be more used. So I, I got hold of some cassette tapes from Beijing Language Institute and some books. The, the college actually got them for me, so I could sort of practice standard Mandarin. So any teacher would confusingly use local dialect pronunciations that were quite different. Um, and the other problem was that their idea of how to teach a language was very different from my idea of how to learn a language. Mm. So I, I mostly learned it um, independently, uh, although I occasionally asked someone to help me, and then I would just go out and try and try and speak it. Do you, were you re- learning to write as well? <clears throat> yes, I, I decided that. I should learn to write at the same time as learning to speak. 
Um, I suppose partly because the the book was structured in that way, the books that I got hold of, but also because learning to read was as, and write was as useful as learning to speak because I couldn't I couldn't write home to anyone in England without putting the address in Chinese on the envelope. The post office wouldn't accept a letter that was mm. only had English written on it in those mm. days. They do now, but not, not then. Uh, if I couldn't read, I wouldn't know what anything was because mm. everything was written on, only in Chinese in the mm. city where I lived in. Nothing was written in English. And um, you were sort of lost without, without reading ability as much as without speaking ability. So I, I put equal effort into learning to read and write and, and, and learn, learning the spoken language. This is a very interesting time, 82, 84. It's just the beginning of the Deng Xiaoping era. Yes. Did you have any sense then that things were on the move and changing even during your time there? Oh, very much so. It was, it, 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 it was as you say, the early um, um, opening and reform period mm. and that was one reason we were there. Um, I remember for example that there'd been a recent change just prior to my arrival which was still being commented on which was that farmers were allowed to bring surplus produce into town and sell it themselves directly on the street. So every morning very early various bicycle carts and wheelbarrows would come in from the fields. Um, and you could get a much better selection of fresh food by buying directly from the farmers along the street. But one of the impacts of this was that although city people benefited from improved supply, they used to moan a lot, my, my students and Chinese fellow Chinese teachers, that the reforms were more beneficial to the farmers than anyone else because they were all getting rich, <laughs> which is quite ironic considering what, 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 what subsequently happened. Mm. Um, obviously people in cities have done perhaps rather better out of most of the reform period but at that early stage it, it appeared to people in the city that this was very 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 much in favour of the farmers um, that they were allowed to trade in that way there was also a certain amount of political un uncertainty about where, where, where things were going and I was there for the last leftist campaign in 1983 of, of um, well unless we have another one in the future but the, the campaign to eradicate spiritual pollution broke with a, an article in the People's Daily um, saying that China was in danger of being um, undermined by culturally polluting Western influences. And um, a campaign was announced. The, the, the left had gained the upper hand briefly in Beijing. And um, this was quite a troubling period because... Um, Briefings were cascaded down to every work unit, including my college, and um, every every um, unit of Chinese society was instructed to go and fulfil a quota of discovering sources of spiritual pollution. Um, and there were some rather vague instructions about Western influence. It was all couched in very ambiguous language, as is uh, often the case. Um, but we, we got wind of this, we were told about it by Chinese friends and it sounded rather worrying so we decided to tackle it head on. So my, my, my fellow British teacher Tanya and I marched off to the College Foreign Affairs Office. So any college with foreign teachers had a foreign affairs office, they slightly outnumbered us, there were only two of us, I think there were three in the office so I don't know what they did most of the time, but they were, not, they were, they were friendly enough. So we went off and we asked for guidance on whether in, in the light of the campaign to um, eradicate spiritual pollution we, we were likely to be considered um, sources of it. And they said, well, we don't know, we're not really sure, we're, we're trying to work it out, but we think you're probably okay, but we will, um, we will ask the higher leaders and get back to you. Um, I suppose the same thing happened in, in, in the handful of colleges and universities in Hunan that employ foreigners. Um, because uh, a couple of days later we were informed that we were invited to a banquet in Changsha, the provincial capital, mm. to be briefed by the education authorities on the province on the campaign to eradicate spiritual pollution. So we went up, had a banquet, um, then had a speech from some senior dignitary which sort of waffled on a bit about the campaign and the importance of it 
and concluded with a reassuring statement that it, in no way should we be concerned that this would target us. Um, and uh, then we said, can we ask questions? And they said, well, no, sorry, the, the dignitary has to leave now. He's very busy. <laughs> so no questions were taken. And we packed up. I was quite worried because I'd recently started teaching Sons and Lovers uh, with my teacher's class of young adults. Mm. And this was because we'd run out of interesting things to study. And D.H. Uh, Lawrence definitely wasn't on the prescribed list. But I, I'd managed to borrow a class set from the British Council in Beijing of uh, Sons and Lovers. And they absolutely loved it. They, mm. they lapped up every page. Um, and I was just a bit worried that, that I was going to get nailed. Uh, in fact, I remember being asked while the campaign was going on. It only lasted a week. So they'd obviously had a sniff around what I was teaching. And one of the sort of Communist Party people who didn't speak English inquired as to what, what is D.H. Lawrence? What's this you're teaching um, the young teachers? And this message was passed on to me. I said, well, it should be it should, it should be encouraged because I said D. H. Lawrence's work is an expose of the evils of capitalist mine owners and how they oppress the the uh, the English workers of the time. I knew enough about China to sort of wrap it up in the inappropriate sort of Chinese Marxist language, and, and it seemed to convince them that they didn't need to inquire further into <laughs> Sons and Lovers. Um, <laughs> fortunately for me, but uh, a week later the campaign collapsed. The mm. um, the anti-left gained the ascendancy and there was another editorial in the People's Daily and the whole show was called off. But it was, it was a very odd week and it mm. was so the last of a series of left-wing campaigns mm. going back to the, the 50s. Quite, quite interesting to mm. live through that, but a, as you probably gather in some ways a rather, rather zany experience. Um, the, the person who wrote to you saying don't come talked about the heavy surveillance and so on. Did you feel under surveillance while you were there? No, I, I, I didn't actually. I, I think that... Um, I, I don't actually think there was, there was a great deal of what you might call surveillance. What there was was a general lack of privacy which applied mm. to everyone. It was the, the culture mm. at the time. Um, and people generally showed a little concern about privacy. Most people slept in communal dormitories. Mm. My teacher's training class, I think, were four to a dormitory. My students were six to a dormitory. Um, living accommodation units were, were small. Um, so I, I don't think people set much store by privacy. Um, I, I think, and I suppose I'm it's turning on a delicate area, but I, in, at that time in China, because I was back in the late 80s with the British Council, I recall a number of cases where I encountered very distressed um, foreigners, non-Chinese, teaching in Chinese institutions who became, I think, quite mentally ill. Um, and it seems symptomatic of this, that they believed that they were under constant surveillance when it was clear to me that they weren't. Mm. Um, was there something about the experience that was making them mentally ill, or did the British Council choose such people, or what? No, I mean, many many of the teachers that went to China at that time, like me, found it quite a positive experience, and mm. and and subsequently returned to China or came back with mm. largely happy memories. Mm. But it was um, as it was for Chinese who came here in the eighties to study um, a deeply. Um, challenging experience because of the, the huge cultural difference mm. and, and how ill-prepared we, we mostly were mm. because there was really no one who could tell us much about it before mm. we encountered it. So I would, uh, my experience was that a minority uh, became distressed or mentally ill as a result and had to, had to leave. Mm. Um, and I, I, you know, I had to deal with some of those situations when, when I worked in the British Embassy for the British Council later. So while I can't give, um, while I have no data, I speak with authority on that it did happen. Mm. And my observation was that in those situations, um, people tended to believe that they were under surveillance. And some of the examples they would, they, they would give were so implausible that it was, it was clearly paranoid. something that was in their head. It was a paranoid, mm. yeah. a par kind of paranoid fantasy. 
So no, I, I didn't feel troubled by surveillance at all. I, I got used to the lack of privacy and learned to manage it. I learned how to disappear and go off radar sometimes, which for my sanity I needed to do. Right, so this is 84, you come back here. Yes. Uh, is that when you did your MLIT in Cambridge? I did MPhil in Cambridge. Uh, yes, um, I, um, learning Chinese was interesting. I learned quite a lot in the two years I was in Hunan. And uh, I'd started to become interested in linguistics when I was at Oxford. I did mm. some papers, optional papers, uh, towards my degree. Um, so I thought it'd be quite interesting to go back to university and do some linguistics. Maybe I'd find I liked it enough to follow an academic career. Um, but I, I was quite pragmatic about it. It was difficult to see how you could apply for a job back in the UK in those days if you were living in China because there was no email. Mm. The journey was long and expensive and you weren't likely to persuade anyone to employ you by writing letters from the middle of China. It wasn't even fashionable or even, they not say, normal mm. to be living in the middle of China wearing a mouse suit. So I thought it was pointless to try and apply for any attractive job, not that I really knew what I wanted to apply for, uh, but it made a lot of sense to go back to university. Um, I didn't go back to Oxford because the linguistics master's course was two years long and I didn't want to make a two-year commitment, I wasn't sure. Mm. But I, I, I learnt that Cambridge had a one-year uh, Master's in Linguistics. And I thought, well, I'll certainly enjoy the course. I, I'll, I'll like the place enough. And um, I'll find out whether I want to carry on doing academic work. And if I don't, I'll be applying for jobs as an Oxbridge student, not as a sort of weirdo in the middle of China writing letters with stamps all over the back of the envelope. <laughs> So I suppose that was that was quite a practical way of approaching it. Um, actually, there was another reason that I hadn't thought of at the time, which was a good reason for um, going to Cambridge, and particularly going to Wolfson. I, I, I chose Wolfson with a bit more information than I had when I applied to Oxford as an 18-year-old, because I obviously knew a bit about universities. Uh, I applied to Wolfson because I thought I would enjoy a mature modern college more having already been to a medieval mm -hmm. college at Oxford and that as an older student with some uh, certain amount of life experience I might not fit in going back to a place that was full of people like I you know as I had been mm -hmm. three or four years before so I, I chose Wolfson quite deliberately but I think it turned out to be a very good choice because there were lots of international students even at that time in Wolfson. There were quite a few students from, from China and, and the wider Chinese world. And this turned out to be very valuable to me because I found that my experiences from China were so strange to most people here as to lose their attention after a minute or two. Mm. They, they, they would ask you politely what it was like and as soon as you tried to explain it, typically people would switch off because it was just so outside their frame of reference. Mm. And I think I would have been distressed if I hadn't had a few people around who could listen sympathetically and and actually believe that what I was saying <laughs> was, uh, was, was, was was accurate and not, not mm. some sort of paranoid fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> so Wolfson was a good choice. For, for and you enjoyed the linguistics course? I did enjoy it, yes. And I, I, I got through it, I did it, I got my MPhil. But I did conclude in that year that I didn't want to settle down to university life. Mm. Uh, but I did find my next move, which was joining the British Council. Mm. Um, really, more from a love of or an interest in working with China than the British Council itself. The British Council I got to know while working in, as a teacher in China because they, they lent us books that were generally helpful. and. Um, I, I thought it would be a very interesting way to go back to China, so I, I joined the British Council because they said I would be guaranteed a, a posting to China within a couple of years of joining, since I could already speak some Chinese. Mm. And that, that was what, what made me drop other ideas of mm. various careers. I decided to give that a try. So you joined the British Council, and how long was it before you went to, back to China? It's not long. I, I, I worked for 18 months in headquarters um, on a trainee posting. I was assigned to the department that um, oversaw relations with communist countries. 
which included China, but otherwise East European countries. Uh, that was quite an interesting job. I was briefed by the relevant departments to brief uh, British lecturers who were going to Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, advise them on um, the various perils that might await them in Prague and so on. And I, I found that quite interesting and it had a little bit to do with China. Um, but then after 18 months I was given a posting to Beijing that would begin a few months later and I asked and was allowed to take six months off for language study to improve my Chinese ahead of working in Beijing and uh, British Council was very flexible um, they let me go to Taiwan which I arranged myself mm. uh, for six months and enrolled as a student in, in university in Taipei I, I chose to go to Taiwan uh, simply because I'd found out that in Taiwan you could live normally amongst Chinese speaking people mm. uh, whereas in China at that time if you went as a foreign student you were in a certain category, you'd be put in a building full of other foreign students, you'd eat mm. with other foreign students. But in, in Taipei at that time, I could lodge with a, with a local family, I could have all my social life with local people. So I effectively went to Taiwan for six months and spoke almost entirely Chinese and nothing else every day. Um, so I arrived in Beijing as a British diplomat with a suspicious Taiwanese accent, but I was, I was quite <laughs> fluent. <laughs> what year was that? 86? 87. 87. Yeah. Interesting time to go. Um, and um, you were with the British Council for how long? Until 2007, so... 20, um, 20, that, 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 that's... Um, 20 years. No, no, I was with the British Council until, yes, 2007, precisely so. 20 years. Mm. Yes, just over 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, had it had it changed already by the time you went back in eighty seven? Well, you were going to Beijing, of course, which was different. What was your re uh, reflection on going to Beijing in eighty seven? Well, the first thing I found was that it was um, <coughs> quite frustrating because in my first two years in China, which weren't weren't, weren't far in the past. I'd lived amongst Chinese people in a, in a, in a Chinese unit. I'd really been in China. Um, at that time, when I'd briefly stayed with a, with a British Council staff member in Beijing who kindly put me up one for a couple of days when I was in, in, in the capital, I'd been very taken with the what seemed to me the very luxurious quality of accommodation provided. Um, I thought this would be a nice number, you know, to do that job and be able to live in a nice flat like this with hot water all the time and air conditioning and loads of space and stuff, carpets and things. Uh, but I have to say, when it became the reality for me, I found it very frustrating because I thought I was in a sort of ghetto of foreign diplomats who um, there was much sort of socialising with ourselves around the pool in the embassy compound at the weekend. And although we had some Chinese staff who supported us, it was it was a bubble, um, and I didn't find the pe most of the people in it particularly interesting. Some I got on with well, but what frustrated me also and annoyed me was the incuriosity about China of quite a lot of the people working in not particularly the British Embassy, the embassies generally. There were some who were genuinely interested, and others who it was just a, a step in a, a global career. Um, no particular interest in experiencing China or finding out a great deal about it outside the narrow confines of their, their duties, whatever they were. And I, I found it annoying and frustrating. So I took every opportunity to escape. I remember the first long weekend I got, which was a few weeks after I arrived, one of the Chinese holiday weekends, I, I simply walked to the train station and took, took a train at random a few hundred miles um, and climbed Mount Tai in Shandong province. Mm, and, the famous. Yes, and met, I, I hadn't been there at that stage, my first trip to Mount Tai, and tried to mix with local Chinese people. Mm. And um, began to feel that I'd finally arrived back in China <laughs> six weeks after I, I returned to, 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 to China. You stayed, stayed in the local. Mm. With, you stayed. 
so you climbed Mount Tai and you stayed with local people. Well, I stayed in a local Chinese hostel yeah, where yeah. foreigners and Chinese could stay. Mm. Um, and from then on, you got out as much as you could. As much as I could, but um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a foreign diplomat at that time in China, there were limits um, you know, to how close you could get to Chinese people without risk, risking getting them into trouble. Mm. So um, much of my social life was with the, the international community. But fortunately, my work, the British Council, which in, 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 in most of it was involved supporting Chinese students to go to the UK, it brought me a lot into contact with Chinese academics, Chinese students. Mm. So once once I got into the job, I, I found it was actually quite interesting. It wasn't all office based. It wasn't all in the diplomatic bubble. It was one of the most interesting jobs in the embassy mm. at that time. And there was also quite a lot of char- opportunities to explore. <coughs> I got a car, which was quite a rare thing in China in those days to have a private car, mm. and you were allowed to drive to quite a lot of places. Mm. Um, and it was quite interesting to drive deep into the countryside, into the mountain areas, go mm. and chat to farmers and so on. So mm. I got enough of a real China experience once I'd worked out how to do it mm. to you know, quite enjoy the um, it was nearly four years I was um, in Beijing, in, in Beijing that, on that first post, so three and a half. You were there till 91. So you were obviously there in May, June 1989, or were you abroad? No, I was there. I actually left in December nineteen um, ninety, mm. at the end of the year. Um, no, I was um, I was in Beijing um, on the fourth of June. In fact, I was actually outside Beijing. I was um, by then. I'd, I'd met my wife to be Moira, who was mm. in China in Beijing um, on, a, on a sort of um, sabbatical year studying Chinese dance at the Dance Academy. So we, we, we were already together then, and some friends of mine were visiting from England. So we, we'd taken them out to visit um, some Eastern tombs outside Beijing, mm. and heard on the, on the BBC World Service that there'd been, there'd been trouble in Beijing. So it took, took quite but a few knew, hours to drive knew, back into the city. You knew before you left, I mean, the, the Tiananmen was already occupied uh, in May, wasn't it? Oh, well, things have been going on for weeks. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we were well, well aware, yes. You may not want to have any reflections on your uh, view from the ground, so to speak, there, but um, uh, are there any thoughts that you want to share with the world about what you've encountered about Tiananmen? I mean, did you have friends involved with it or who were there? No, I, I didn't have friends involved with it. Um, what um, what I, I do recall um, is I, 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 I chatted to some of the students. This was going on for weeks, and I, once or twice I went down and chatted to some of the students from universities that I knew about. Mm. And what, what struck me was the, the great vagueness of whatever they were demonstrating for. Mm. And I say that simply because it's what I encountered. Mm. When I asked people, why are you here? What, what, what's this about? It was a bit like um, me and Catholicism. They were just doing what everyone else was doing. So I could see. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that was my wife's experience as well, which she shared. She was at, a, at, the, at the dance academy in Beijing, and one day some students said, oh, let's all go to Tiananmen Square. That's what everyone's doing. Um, so... Um, I don't know. I mean, these things um, are in the past, but and, and I don't really have a huge amount of evidence. But I would say, with some confidence, that quite a lot of people were involved because of imitative behaviour. Mm. Didn't did I mean when you heard the leaders, they talked in generalities about democracy and the overthrow of this and that, but they didn't get down to many specifics, which ties in with what. Or saying, I mean, if you asked people what exactly they wanted, they knew what they didn't want. But did the people you talked to or the leaders appear to be aware of what they were really wanting? I, I would say not, actually, and I and I also um, I don't think 
there was ever a particularly cogent agenda set out or, or, or any intention to set one out. I, I don't recall it. Mm. Um, they, they seemed very normal, the students there, but also very unclear about why, why they were there. They had a number of complaints about you know, the quality of from the quality of food on campus to the cost of living, um, general dissatisfaction, but they didn't they didn't they didn't seem to me to um, have signed up to any particular vision of the future. And what about the reaction uh, of the the government? I mean, there are various views about whether. It, it was necessary to clear it, or whether that was the best way to clear it, or the use of the army and so on. Did you do you have any views on any of that? I was very surprised it it it, it ended um, as violently as it as it appears to have done, uh, simply because it seemed to me to be um, diminishing in intensity in in the, in the weeks prior to that. It could have left, been left to fizzle out. Do you think? Well, I don't know, but I, I, I was very surprised. My, my expectation by by the end of May was that it would it would quietly fizzle out, mm. uh, as as things often do. I d- didn't expect that it would 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 be ended abruptly. Mm. Then afterwards, did you notice a a lot of tightening up um, in surveillance or anything else? Was your life affected? It was somewhat tightened up, um, but particularly so in, in, in Beijing and particularly in Peking University. Um, so I recall that for about a year afterwards, we weren't able to go into some of the university campuses. We were still able to do our job. Um, I, I stayed for a, a few days after the 4th of June as a sort of reduced embassy staff. There was quite a lot of British students that wanted to leave. Mm. Uh, because they felt they weren't sure what would happen. There were a few who refused to leave, um, contrary to the wishes of their parents and their home universities in, in, in the United Kingdom, which was quite a, put us in quite a dilemma. But um, there was quite a lot to do for a couple of weeks, and then there was really nothing to do because things got very quiet. So I, I went. I think I went early on on summer leave um, and got married <laughs> as planned. <laughs> <laughs> while well, I was on summer leave, but, but Maura and I went back to, to Beijing in the late summer, early autumn of 89, and to some extent for us, life returned to normal fairly, fairly quickly. I think university programmes were quite affected for about a year, mm. um, but, but most of the routine of diplomatic life and British Council life became normal again, I suppose quicker than we, we felt it would. Did you stay in Beijing all the time that you were in the British Council? Or? I ha- um, no, I, I did um, three postings in China. The, the, that, that was the first. The second one was in Hong Kong in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. But although I was living in Hong Kong um, by then with family, my responsibilities were in the south of mainland China, so I, I travelled a lot. And then the final posting as director of the British Council was from 2000 to 2007, so back in Beijing. And in between, I worked in British Council headquarters in in London, Mm -hmm. um, generally dealing with the British Council's relationship with with Whitehall. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was either Mandarin or Mandarins, my my 20-year career. (laughs) I mean, you're there for such a fascinating time uh, with the sudden growth of China um, after... 1991, 92, uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai and so on. People are just amazed at what uh, the growth and the change of that period. Um, when did you really get a sense that something extraordinary was happening? That's quite interesting. Um, as early as my first time in China in the early 80s, when really China, although things were clearly stirring, it was changing. Um, there were the, the very small beginnings of, of what became the Chinese market economy. Nevertheless, most people, including myself, expected China to remain 
uh, a society based on the bicycle for the rest of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. We used to joke and say, well, what would this place be like if all these cyclists had cars? We didn't know that can't possibly happen. It's unimaginable. It would never work. Of course, it's precisely what happened. Except many of them have two cars. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I do remember my, my, my British colleague in, in, in Hunan days, Tanya, who'd done a degree in Chinese at Leeds and previously spent a year in Beijing as a student, who was certainly wiser to China than I was, saying that this is all going to change. And she actually broadly foresaw that China would be a rising economic power um, and that that would happen under the leadership of the Communist Party and that China within our lifetimes would be... Um, massively influential and rich. She was quite clear about this and precisely right, I would say, so I'll credit her with that. So that at least opened my eyes to the possibility, but I don't think I was a um, confident believer in uh, China rising to the extent that it has done in the last um, three decades at that stage. Um, then I was back in the late 80s. Um, I think it wasn't really until the mid 90s um, when I was back in Hong Kong and looking at what was happening in South China, looking at how much money quite a lot of people seemed to have, this has occurred to me that um, all this stuff that was being stated about in the West at the time about how you know a country, a socialist country that didn't have liberal democracy couldn't possibly become very wealthy, that this was probably about to be proved wrong, um, and. Yes, I think it was the mid '90s. It was it was the it was the quite dramatically growing growing affluence of individuals that made me feel that. And also, I think that it seems to me there have been two quite different sides to the rise of China as an economic power. Um, the one that's rather more talked about and commented on in the West is the role of the state. Mm. So massive national champions that have been built and. Um, gargantuan infrastructure projects and this is very important but the other aspect that's commented on a little less has been the release of Chinese entrepreneurial energy um, which is uh, it has depended on, 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 on a somewhat more per permissive policies gradually being implemented but it hasn't been sort of driven by government it's driven by individual enterprise in China and without that, I, there's no no way China would have achieved the, the economic strength that it has uh, in such a short time. And being in South China in the mid-90s, I was very exposed particularly to that side. Because as you go further south in China, it appears to me that the proportion of the state in economic growth diminishes somewhat and the, and the role of the private sector grows the further south you go. And it was just seeing how creative, energetic, and successful people were becoming in large numbers in, in Guangdong and elsewhere at the time. Um, I, I already knew that the Chinese government could organize large projects. I'd seen that in Beijing. But when I saw how smart at business the Cantonese had become, then I began to sort of put two and two together and decide that it might equal more than four. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly has. Um, we're now at an interesting turning point where America has become aware of what's happening um, and uh, there's quite a lot of tension and so on. So it's a time perhaps to ask you about what you think is likely to happen over the next 10 years or so in China and um, in its relations with the West. Well, I find such a question difficult because I think there's there's a problem with predicting the future, which is that it's not predictable, yeah. because a number of things might happen. Yes, of course. Uh, so a prediction, if it's right, it's purely by chance. Yes, obviously. Um, and I, you're, you're, you're with me on that, so I, 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 I'll, I'll just all, give All we point. know is that whatever you say will be wrong, but... Um, That's also true. I'll, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> the more precise I am, the more certain it is that but, I shall be wrong. Are you I shall be wrong. basically optimistic or pessimistic about the future of China? I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic. Um, I actually think there's a great deal has been achieved in China in, in the last 40 years. Um, 
I, I was arguing with, 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 with a British friend the other day um, who was teasing me for now that I work part-time for a Chinese state company as part of my sort of retirement consultancy work and um, I was sort of being quite defensive of the, the, the more positive aspects of modern China and the economic progress and the much greater freedom that most people enjoy to travel the world and choose educational pathways for their children in a way that they, they couldn't in the past and it was put to me that uh, yes 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 I know that they've lifted millions of people out of poverty but 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 and I couldn't resist pointing out that millions was a was a huge underestimate they actually hundreds of millions mm. fewer people are poor in China than when I first went mm. there 30 six, years ago not, not, not millions hundreds of millions mm. and these these aren't these aren't small things to be dismissed with a but it seems mm. to me um, what whatever one feels about uh, any other aspect of China mm. these are you know, this is a difference between misery and some degree of well-being and prosperity for mm. you know, Quite a significant proportion of our of our species. One tenth we, we should, of the world. We shouldn't belittle it yeah. um, for the sake of political purposes. I, I believe that quite strongly. Um, I think also that um, rising educational levels in China, which is uh, it's like the economic progress. It's been a com- it's a combination effect of quite well organised top top down policies and a uh, huge individual effort and commitment um, so that commitment to learning from families and young people combined with them policies that have made um, many years of state education free and of reasonable quality compared to many countries um, is actually leading to significant advances in educational level of the uh, large, large, very large numbers of Chinese people, and that—that that, that I suppose is my main basis for optimism. Clearly, China has huge problems, uh, particularly of environmental degradation. Not not only China, but China perhaps particularly has very large-scale problems of that kind, and problems I think in also that its it, its well-being has depended on very high levels of economic growth, which hardly anyone, including in in China, thinks are sustainable for much longer. So. Those, 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 those are enormous challenges that China faces but I think the, the biggest um, the best basis for optimism is simply that most people are much smarter than, than people were 30 years ago they know a lot more, they can do a lot more uh, and that to me is very important of course I've worked in education for most of my life Well I think that's probably a very good point to end on but I should note that we've missed out the last 12 years of your life here, <laughs> yeah, d- during which you've held several very important jobs with the Cambridge Trusts and with Cambridge uh, Education. Um, and if we had another hour, we could fill it with all that. But it was really China that um, I wanted to talk to you about because I've always been impressed by your extraordinary linguistic ability in Chinese and your interest in China. So. On that point, I would just like to um, wish you all success in the next 20 years. So thank you very much indeed, Michael. Thank you.